So welcome everybody who's with us at the moment to the IADI webinar on how to reach the extreme poor through inclusive development policies in sub-Saharan Africa with professors Nikki Powell and Marlene Decker. I am Rowena. I'm going to be moderating today's discussion. I'm joining you today from Australia and I understand that many of our participants today are from around the world. So uh, hello if you got up in time in Costa Rica and also colleagues joining us uh, from Africa. Some of you may be new to IADI so I will just uh, briefly explain who they are. IADI is the European Association of Development Research and Training Institutes and it's a Europe-wide network of researchers and students in all fields of development and it promotes quality in research and education in development studies and it also promotes the exchange of information amongst members to strengthen networks and influence development decision makers. Very important in this time um, that we're facing in the world. So uh, this is the 19th webinar in the IADI series. And uh, before going into the webinar, just a few technical points. So Professors Powell and Decker are going to present for about 30 minutes and they will check in with us at a couple of points throughout their presentation to see if anything that they've said needs any clarification. At the end of their presentation, we will then have time for wider comments and wider discussion. So about our speakers today, we have Nikki Powell, who is an associate professor for, uh, in economics of well-being at the Amsterdam Institute for Social Science Research. Her international research projects involve a lot of collaboration with local governments, ministries, NGOs, civil society and, and other stakeholders on the ground. And she is also very engaged in pushing the scientific and public discussion on inclusive development and rethinking the economy from a broader well-being perspective. And I believe you have a book in progress on the economics of well-being, which we are very much uh, looking forward to when that comes out. And she will be joined today by Marlene Decker, a professor of inclusive development in Africa at Leiden University. And Professor Decker is trained as a human geographer but holds a PhD in development economics. So it's no surprise that her research is interdisciplinary in nature. The focus of her work is on behavioral determinants of access to and use of formal and informal financial services. And as well as inclusive development and her collaboration on research across Africa, Professor Decker also coordinates the Secretariat of INCLUDE, the knowledge platform on inclusive development policies in Africa. And it is definitely uh, worth you checking out if you Google INCLUDE platform. So I'm now going to hand over uh, to Professor Decker and I hope you have your audio sorted. Uh, is, are you all good? I can see Marlene nodding. So that's a relief to me. Um, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Nikki, could you send up the slide on the structure of today's presentation? What I would like to do is I would like to start off with a little bit of background and introduction. Then I will hand over to Nikki who will present the first empirical case, uh, which can be followed by some uh, clarifying questions from your side. Then I will present the second empirical case again with some room for clarifying questions and then Nikki will present um, an analytical framework that we would then like to discuss with the group um, and also hear feedback or examples from the group before we come to the concluding remarks. So by way of background and introduction, uh, next slide please. Um, the starting point of today's presentation is the observation that structural inequalities prevail globally and that the benefits of sustained economic growth as was witnessed in Africa over the past two decades have not sufficiently reached the extreme poor. The current pandemic moreover also demonstrates stark dividing lines between the poor and the affluent. Um, and despite the increased attention to people living in extreme poverty, especially in the context of the SDGs, leaving no one behind has certainly not been achieved. And this, and we know that, um, poses significant threats to both future economic growth, but also social cohesion, political stability, and as well as environmental sustainability. At the same time, and the French economist uh, Piketty alluded to that recently, we know that inequality is also a political choice. 
Now, recognizing these structural inequalities and the possible political and policy choices to reduce inequality, in 2014, includes designed the NWO Voto research program called Research on Inclusive Development in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in the vision of the platform, inclusive development requires policies for productive employment and social protection to ensure that poor and vulnerable groups also benefit from growth. Moreover, these inclusive policies need to be supported by coalitions of strategic actors to actually make, uh, have them implemented. So the RITSA program was organized along these three cross-cutting themes, strategic actors, productive employment and social protection. And uh, uh, within the program, 17 international research projects were selected and they studied interventions, uh, programs, processes, um, in these policy domains, for example, in agriculture value chain development, but also um, relating to health insurance or cash transfers, uh, zooming in on local entrepreneurs and multi multinational businesses, and looking into the advocacy and representation of, for example, indigenous groups and informal sector workers. Today, Nikki and I will present two case studies to you. Um, and discuss how the empirical findings of these case studies build up to an analytical framework that we can use to understand inclusive development policy choices and outcomes. But this analytical framework will then form the organizing principle for a special issue that we are preparing on this research program. And now I would like to hand over to Nikki to start a presentation of the first case. Thank you, Marlene. Um, trying to move to the next slide. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to uh, present on uh, one of the cases that were funded under the Include Knowledge uh, platform. And this is a research that uh, I carried out together with Katja Bender and with research uh, partners in Ghana and in Kenya on the topic of uh, breaking the vicious circle between ill health and poverty. Uh, we, there are numerous studies that have analyzed, of course, uh, already short-term impacts of social protection uh, instruments uh, on poverty and vulnerability in developing uh, countries. Uh, but so far the results uh, show uh, yeah, mixed results. And the focus was always on a singular uh, instrument and never on a, a set of instruments. Um, and these studies, they have uh, contributed to a growing discourse on social protection as constitutive of inclusive growth or inclusive development in, uh, in Africa. Uh, like it has done so in, in uh, Latin America and, and Asian countries. Um, in Africa, we find a wide range of, across the countries, we find a wide range of uh, social protection uh, policies and programs in place. These range from national level, social health insurances, pension schemes, to the more uh, targeted uh, cash transfer programs that are either conditional or unconditional. Uh, many of these programs started out uh, with support from donors, but this landscape uh, of finance is changing at the moment uh, rather quickly. Um, so far, uh, what is reported is that the poor and especially extreme poor people are undercovered in social protection, although of course they are targeted. Um, in the African health sector, they form the, the weakest link. Um, in our study, um, we decided to look at uh, multiple social protection instruments in Ghana and Kenya and how these affect uh, especially the poor and the extreme poor compared to the better off. In Ghana, we looked at the National Health Insurance Scheme and the uh, Livelihood and, and, uh, Against Poverty uh, Program, which is a cash transfer program. In Kenya, we looked at the, um, yeah, the national uh, health uh, insurance uh, uh, scheme and the uh, cash transfer for orphans and vulnerable children. Um, 
uh, as part of the research, we were interested to see if there are any synergy effects between different instruments, uh, between the social health insurance on the one hand and the cash transfer on the other hand. And do people benefit from uh, a combined effect of both? Um, for the study, uh, which was very comprehensive, we used the mixed methodology approach. Uh, on the one hand, we worked with uh, two waves of panel data in Ghana uh, to do the quantitative impact analysis. Uh, for Kenya, we unfortunately did not have this, uh, these uh, waves of data available. Uh, so there, and, and also in Ghana, we did the community level participatory impact uh, assessment study um, looking at well-being effects. And we embedded this in a multi-level political economy analysis. Uh, the key findings, and, and I present a selection of findings only, uh, and I will uh, reference you to the outputs where other findings can be found. Uh, but with regards to the uh, quantitative uh, impact assessment, uh, where we looked at uh, impact over a period of uh, two two and a half years uh, of time in Ghana, we observed positive of, uh, individual effects of the national health insurance and the LEAP uh, program on household food consumption, uh, health and education for non-poor and poor, including the extreme poor. But only people who are better off report uh, as a result of uh, uh, social protection, higher investments in productive assets and labor. The synergy effects, that is uh, uh, the combined effects of uh, being a member of two uh, of these programs, uh, and when that is higher than the sum of the individual effects, we can speak of a synergy effect, uh, were insignificant. Um, and a uh, booty exception of one child anthropometric uh, measure, weight for age. There's only anecdotal evidence so far of positive in interaction effects, eh? for example, between uh, 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 higher food consumption and uh, performing uh, better in school. Uh, the poor and extreme poor are found to uh, face barriers in realizing the full potential potential of social protection. We also observed high dropout rates where uh, households uh, or individual members uh, were a member of a national health insurance scheme in one year, they dropped out the next year if the renewal fee was uh, too high, for example. Social capital and other assets and capabilities are, uh, uh, are apparently a prerequisite to benefit uh, in these countries from social protection and to um, embark on uh, improving uh, household uh, income and well-being. There are multiple hidden costs that we came across, especially on the side of people who are very vulnerable or extremely poor. Uh, this can uh, vary from uh, high traveling costs, waiting times at cash dissemination points or accessing health centers, also non-compliance to uh, being serviced at local health centers, and even basic transaction costs that are perceived as too high. Uh, for example, the annual card renewal fees or lack of resources at health centers that uh, people are expected then to buy themselves before being uh, treated by, uh, by the doctors. Second set of findings is that uh, social protection beneficiaries do not respond to risk management mechanisms in the same way. Uh, we found, for example, that young people, they uh, often opt out of the national health insurance because they consider to be healthy already and they see it as a waste of uh, money. Um, Furthermore, uh, at the local, regional and national level, we find institutional, social, political and geographic context factors that mediate and moderate positive impacts of social protection. And added to this, uh, program design and implementation failures uh, lead to the 
exclusion of people who are poorest. We did observe from the participatory research positive spillover effects on well-being at uh, individual and household level, but also in the community. People reported enhanced uh, social status. Uh, they felt seen as uh, citizens um, by the state. There were also positive uh, reports of uh, increased trust in institutions, but only in those places where uh, the allocation of social protection is perceived as socially just and, and free from corruption or favoritism. Otherwise, negative spillover effects emerge, such as jealousy and uh, conflict. Final set of findings, um, and this uh, comes more from the uh, political economy analysis that we also did, uh, because we were interested in the reform dynamics of these uh, social protection policy instruments. Um, and the different instruments uh, are really found to be governed within ministerial silos, often lacking a, a nationally concerted effort. Um, because of their different uh, histories, um, uh, and, and uh, political and institutional uh, interests and communication dynamics, the policy reform dynamics also differ across these different pillars of social protection. Um, we find, we uh, think that based on the research, social economic policy should really rethink design and implementation from the perspective of the extreme poor, yeah? how to overcome these hidden costs. Uh, these are not only economic, but also social or political in nature, and reduce transaction costs so that the, 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 the social protection becomes more affordable and accessible to the lower income groups. Furthermore, we find that there is a broad-based public support and debate needed uh, for people to really agree on uh, who is entitled and who is so-called uh, deserving, uh, who are the, the, the deserving poor. So this implies a renewed uh, social contract also with the state. Um, it was a very comprehensive study that we did, but we think it helped to shed light on the multidimensional outcomes of social protection and also to understand these complex underlying mechanisms that are sometimes hidden. Uh, and that lead to exclusion of the extreme poor. Okay, uh, over to you, Marlene. Oh no, sorry, to Rowena, um, uh, because we want to ask if there are uh, uh, questions at this point. Yes, so we're saving our broad discussions right for the very end, but at this point, if there's any um, elements that anybody needs clarifying, please, you can wave your hand in the in the chat. There is a little button that you can put your hand up or um, or if it's easier for you to type rather than find that button, please let me know. Um, but just to emphasize, we're looking for clarifying questions at the moment, just to keep the speakers on topic. Is there anyone? Uh, I've got John Boateng, you have your hand up, but it has been up for a while, so I'm not sure if it was specifically around around this. Otherwise, I don't see anybody else signalling that they have a question at this stage. Okay, shall I continue then? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so the second case that we are presenting today um, is that on feeder roads in Ethiopia. Um, and this research project was led by Maggie Lung, um, together with Kredis Ramot and Kebe de Manjur. Maggie and Kredis were at the University of Utrecht. And it specifically looked into infrastructure development, um, a topic that ranks high on the policy options to promote more inclusive development. Especially rural roads are credited um, with the potential for social economic transformation, um, to enhance access to markets, administrative centers, schools and health posts. Um, in a sense, rural roads are assumed to lead to improvements in agricultural productivity due to better access to labor, uh, input and food. 
But of course, we also know that roads by themselves do not decrease inequality. So an important question to be asked is how the gains of this road and the gains of increased access are distributed among the population. Next slide, please. Um, so this project investigated the specific ways in which road development promotes productive employment, specifically looking at both direct employment, so employment related to the construction of the road, but also two forms of indirect employment related to improved mobility and access and related to improved water management by changes in road design. Um, the project used survey data, focus group discussions and oral testimonies in four communities from two oredas in Tigray, Ethiopia, where feeder roads were constructed in the 1990s and more recently. And the research group specifically focused on perceptions as shared by the uh, beneficiaries or the, the population in the area. Next slide, please. So the first set of key findings relates to direct employment. Um, from the discussions that the research group held, it was quite clear that both skilled and unskilled workers uh, gained access to employment in road, uh, road construction and both within the project areas as well as outside the project areas. Um, this was the actual work on the road, but also work related to stone grinding, transport, etc. cetera. Um, in general, the, rate, the wage rate, working hours and conditions were generally found uh, satisfactory by the, the, the respondents, um, but there were some wage differentials observed based by the type of contractor um, that was used to build the road and related to gender differences. Basically, this meant that private contractors were less um, willing to employ women working on the road. And obviously, these direct employment benefits are limited in time and temporal in nature. Next slide, please. Um, when it comes to the indirect employment effects, um, the study found that, that these employment effects were much larger in magnitude. Um, more than 90% of the respondents indicated that they believe that the construction of feeder road has been beneficial and opened new opportunities uh, that were not commonly available before. And this relates especially to access to inputs that could improve production also access to markets to sell agricultural produce, including perishable crops. Um, and often these linkages were made through traders, either private traders or wholesale traders. Um, there was uh, an observed increase in roadside businesses and an observed demand for day labor and off farm employment. Interestingly, road design can also lead to more employment because it can add to good water management, leading to more resilience, less erosion, and generally lower maintenance cost of the road. And a specific survey observed that increased water availability and soil moisture um, led to a wider variety of crops to be cultivated and an estimated increase of family incomes with 20 to 30%. Next slide, please. Now, what is interesting and what is important in the context of, of this program is that these direct and indirect employment effects may be positive on average, uh, but there are some hidden dynamics um, in the heterogeneity of access to these benefits. And often the research group was able to, to um, trace back these, these dynamics to the starting position of the household at the time of construction. For example, what was observed is that the access to inputs that could lead to a higher crop diversity was largely mediated through access to extension services. So this means that households that didn't have access to the extension services also didn't have access to these inputs. Similarly, um, the, access to the access to food markets was especially important for surplus food producers. Um, and for example, also for agriculture labor households who could then sell labor on the labor market. On the other hand, the cash poor and female headed households didn't have access to, um, 
to these markets. And in fact, female-headed households uh, who didn't have food were um, uh, were negatively affected because they had to walk larger distances to places where food was available. When it comes to roadside businesses, it was observed that it is mostly urban and asset rich households and that are able to establish such such businesses. Um, and the benefit for day laborers also very much depended on the context, the geographical context in which the road was built because of the uh, regional labor shortages or lead regional um, surplus labor. A final point that was observed by, um, by the research group is that the affordability of transport also makes is, is a, a clear dividing line between having between being able to access the benefits or not. And what was observed that in, in some areas the poor still often only use the road by foot because um, transport uh, affordable transport is not available. So um, that's that's my report on the um, in the the feeder road project. Maybe we can open up for a few clarifying questions in case they are there before Nikki uh, takes it on to the analytical framework. Certainly, thank you, Marlene. Um, any clarifying questions from anybody participating, do feel free to raise your hand or as everyone seems so well behaved, um, feel free to just leap in and unmute yourself. Everybody's looking quite keen to hear more at the moment. So if, oh, here we go. Um, so there is a question come through. Can you give us some details about your sampling as well as the time frame of the project? Was it a retrospective study? Yeah, so um, when it comes to the, I, I imagine that this is a question related to the feeder road project. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so this was indeed, this is indeed a retrospective study and it's really a study about the, per the perceptions of the beneficiaries. Um, and they um, selected four areas, two areas, and sorry, they selected two Voredas and within each Voreda, one area where a road was constructed in the 1990s and one area where a road was constructed recently. Uh, especially um, because it takes time for the effects to sort of materialize for the beneficiaries. Uh, I also see a question coming in on the water management. Um, so this specific uh, element looks into how you can, uh, by changing the design of the road and um, designing the road in such a way that the water is harvested, um, that water can then be used for irrigation of particular crops. And it was calculated by uh, the research team that an 8% extra investment um, leads to these um, extra incomes uh, by the households. So it's really about how you construct the road, how you then enable through the construction better water harvesting that can be used by households, obviously households that are relatively close to the road um, for irrigation purposes. And a question has just come through on the road project. Um, is there any analysis on the possible impact on better access to schooling or health services? No, there's no, no specific um, impact analysis done on that. It was reported that uh, both schools and health services are better um, accessible because even when people use the road on foot, uh, mobility is still increased. Um, so that has been reported, but, but not the impact in terms of education or schooling, uh, sorry, schooling or health status. And then looking at the created employment, is it known if the labour was local or labours that migrated to, to take part? They were both, both from the uh, project area as well as outside the project area. Great, okay. 
if unless we have any more questions i think uh oh we've got some more coming through uh so uh bezel and i'm delighted my colleague bezel joining us from zimbabwe hello um has a question on road design what, that he has observed in uh, zimbabwe and bezel feel free if you want to talk about this please do un unmute yourself i'm sure that uh, marlene and nikki would prefer to hear from you rather than me no okay um then the context in zimbabwe oh here we go bezel can we hear you yeah. Yes, I was, I was uh, saying that. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Are you able to hear me? We can hear you, Bezel. The, the context in, in Zimbabwe has been that um, I... Okay, thank you. I can go ahead. I'm saying my observation is that um, there was a massive development of road infrastructure from the 1990s and in most rural areas have been tarred. And what I have observed is that most areas that used to have been affected in the negative, you know, sense to the extent that even the small gardens that used to be quite, you know, vibrant in those areas are now facing, you know, serious shortages of water. And the rivers which used to be very perennial are no longer perennial after the construction and the surfacing of the roads so i think you you may want to reflect again on this observation to maybe increase the the size of the population so that at least you can have a broader you know kind of projects to look at so that at least we can agree that the roads design of course from the roads design you know context there is that aspect of drainage which they put in to protect the road itself. But whether then that uh, protects the downstream infrastructure to the extent that it is anticipated is something that we need to debate in a very long time. That, that's my observation on that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bezo, for sharing that. I think it, what your point alludes to is that it's very important to really look at the specific context. Um, this particular project uh, looked at rural roads, um, and these are not tarred roads, so they're gravel roads. Um, and of course, you know, it, it's, it has been a relatively short time period. And I think what you're, you're alluding to is that it's important to take to also take a longer term perspective. And then of course, also related to the actual rainfall um, that is received. Thank you. Okay, I know that you guys have a few more uh, points to make before we go to a wider discussion. So uh, I think, is it Nikki, would you like to progress? Yes, thank you, Rovena. Uh, let me move to the next slides. Um, okay. As Marlene announced um, at the beginning, uh, we are uh, across all the uh, seven, or not all, but across uh, the 17 uh, studies that were carried out under the umbrella of INCLUDE. Um, uh, yeah, we are trying to draw uh, the, the bigger lessons and uh, a selection of them will feature in a special issue that we are preparing for now. And uh, in uh, preparing for that, we, uh, we designed an analytical framework uh, that guides uh, the analysis and that is the uh, organizing principle for this special issue. But this is work in progress and we would very much like to take this opportunity to share this with you and to collect comments and feedback um, also based on your own research and, and uh, expertise on uh, inclusive development policies. But let me uh, first talk you through it briefly. Um, from all the, uh, the studies that were carried out and we only presented two cases uh, today. Um, it, but it was very clear that it is important to, to look at uh, inclusive development policies at, the, um, at multiple levels uh, and 
we have uh, labeled these the macro, the meso, and the micro uh, economic uh, level to see um, uh, how the, uh, the policy is uh, conceptualized and uh, designed and implemented and how that uh, is communicated to the different uh, levels of organization in the economy. Um, so that is where on the left hand we have macro, meso, micro. Then the instruments, uh, we have organized those uh, or the domains according to the three pillars uh, of the uh, include uh, knowledge platform uh, studies, strategic collaboration, productive employment and social protection. Um, and what comes out of uh, all of these studies is that in order to uh, create uh, or, or to uh, move closer towards uh, equality of opportunity to benefit from these policies and programs, uh, that it is from the perspective of the extreme poor, uh, uh, critically important to remove uh, these hidden costs and also to bring down the transaction costs. Um, and these costs may be economic uh, or social or political in nature. Uh, hidden costs are costs that are uh, not necessarily known uh, to everyone uh, and they may present uh, themselves in in the process of uh, implementing the policy and in the rollout of the, of the program. And they may be very specific to, to subgroups, uh, to, to population subgroups. So they may be faced by one group, but not by the other. Um, transaction costs are costs that are known, that are usually known, but that may be uh, uh, unaffordable uh, to to people at the lower end of the income distribution. Um, but they may also be non-economic uh, in nature. Um, and this creates uh, a lot of differences ultimately in equality of opportunity to benefit from, uh, from uh, inclusive development policies. Uh, it may be there on paper, but not, not in reality. Um, in addition, there are some projects, and, and Marlene, we have not really uh, talked about that, so maybe we can elaborate on this in the discussion. A number of projects have uh, uh, indicated there are institutional barriers in uh, access and in accessing uh, uh, inclusive development policies and programs that lead to uh, inequalities in terms of effectiveness. Okay, so how uh, can uh, the target uh, beneficiaries realize uh, effective benefits from uh, the policies and programs? And there are differences there also across certain subgroups. Um, all the projects uh, in one way or the other uh, looked uh, into uh, broader uh, effects of uh, uh, welfare, well-being. Uh, we, uh, we prefer to adopt a well-being lens because it uh, allows us to look at uh, material and the social, re relational and uh, subjective aspects of well-being, but also to uh, look at this at uh, the level of individuals and households, but also at uh, group or, or community uh, level. And I'm very happy that uh, Alistair McGregor joins us today because it's uh, his approach that we are uh, using here. And uh, it is especially in uh, maybe uh, uh, these other dimensions where there are mechanisms uh, at work uh, against uh, poor people or vulnerable groups to access uh, social protection or other uh, or productive employment or benefits from uh, networks and strategic collaborations. So therefore we think this multidimensional approach is really important. Um, but uh, as 
said, this is a work in progress, so we uh, would very much like uh, to invite your comments and feedback on it, and, and maybe uh, you, you find that it is incomplete or there are elements that need to be added. Um, and we are open to, uh, to your suggestions on this. Over to you, Rowena. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of comments coming through from people and I'm getting feedback on my own voice. So, um, so Katasnia um, has just put a comment in on the, um, on the framework. Um, she's saying it appears to be a static model while your case studies were particularly illustrative to a policy cycle. So how can each of these stages be more inclusive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so that is a, a comment or a, a question? Uh, it is a question. She is asking, and Katarzyna, feel free, if you would like to, you can unmute yourself and elaborate on your on your question, should you wish. But she's saying that uh, the case studies were illustrative to a policy cycle, such as policy design, implementation, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah. So how could each of these stages be made more inclusive, for example, co-creation or um, iterative feedback loops? Ah, okay. Yes, and that's a very good uh, point. I um... Uh, all of the studies were indeed uh, asked to to reflect on this and also to the extent possible to build it in into the project the research project design even to to build in elements of co-creation i must say the the uh, for my own project at least maybe marlene can elaborate on the other projects um, these were two years uh, research projects or, or at least the social protection uh, only had two years the earlier ones had three years which appeared to be a very short time to uh, engage uh, effectively into uh, co-creation and social learning for example together with policy makers uh, we very much tried and we think this is very very important indeed but uh, the time and resources needed to, uh, to invest in that uh, should not be underestimated. And um, mm. yeah, from my own experience in, in the social protection research project, uh, these resources were quite limited and uh, we have not managed uh, to live up to the full potential, but uh, no, ideally from the start of the, the project, uh, you uh, exchange with uh, people in policy, uh, uh, people who are managing these programs, uh, NGOs or civil society organizations to see where hidden costs can be removed and where transaction costs can be lowered so that true equality of opportunity uh, is realized. Marlene, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I think the point that you're making is very, very uh, relevant, Nikki. And it also relates a little bit to the question that Ruud Ruben just asked about uh, guaranteeing inclusiveness in the, the COVID-19 mitigation responses. I think what, what all of the research really points at is that policy that is there on paper um, is it's not the same when it's implemented. So there are um, unintended consequences and there is hi both hidden and transaction costs for people to actually benefit from what should be available to them um, in terms of new opportunities. So I think, um, of course, from a research perspective, but also from a policy perspective, what this means is that monitoring program implementation becomes much more in, uh, important. So it's not about, you know, having an evaluation when starting to implement a program. It's not about having an evaluation in four years time, but having continuous monitoring during implementation and having iterative feedback loops to then either adjust implementation when you realize that 
either there are these hidden and transaction costs that exclude the extreme poor and the poor or there are unintended consequences so that there's you know all, there's all this possibility to um respond in terms of implementation and i think in the current context of COVID mitigation this is also essential all sorts of programs are currently being designed and implemented with an assumption that they will reach um, those most in need but that assumption would have to be tested and monitored on the ground and um, you know this whole thinking about okay what are the transaction costs and the hidden costs for the poor to actually benefit from um, this intervention i think i'm not entirely sure but i think that uh, also mora goodwin is in the group and her research the research that she did in rwanda also points at these more institutional um yeah challenges that nikki also referred to thank you um we have a question from esther um and she would like to know how you factor in change across time environment and risk And Esther, if you're there and you want to expand on that question, uh, please feel free to unmute, unmute and join the discussion. And then queuing up the next question, if you want to, to consider that one. So that was, uh, change, how do you factor in changes across time, environment and miss? Uh, Leo Dehan is um, just would like to know how transformation was defined in the Ghana case. Okay, um, well, if I understand Esther's question correctly, this is a comment uh, in relation to the analytical framework. And uh, yeah, I think uh, it's important uh, what you say that uh, there are dynamic changes over time and uh, especially um, from one year to the other indeed. There are uh, uh, policy uh, design changes. Um, there's upscaling uh, going on in many African countries of social protection policies, for example, or, uh, or cash transfer programs. Um, and uh, if, if you look at uh, impact over time, you need to factor in those uh, changes, of course. Um, and what uh, but what we are limited by at the moment is uh, availability of data. This is really a constraint, especially if you want to do um, dynamic uh, model analysis using uh, quantitative data on a large scale. And uh, so far, we've only been able to cover uh, two and a half uh, year period. So that's uh, only short term impact, I would say. Um, but we can expect indeed uh, uh, with changes in the, uh, in, the in the program design, for example, in, in Ghana, the national health insurance fee has been uh, increased uh, over the years. So uh, you might expect uh, synergy effects to emerge after a longer period of time, maybe, uh, because at the beginning, the fees that were, were paid uh, once every two months was only uh, something like uh, uh, eight uh, Ghanaian uh, sedis, uh, one and a half euro, um, uh, for uh, single person households up to uh, a couple of euros uh, for four person or, or bigger households. And now it's already uh, 16 euros. So there are these changes, of course. Um, also, there are important changes in terms of uh, how complaints are dealt with yeah, in the allocation of uh, entitlements. Uh, are there referral mechanisms in place? Um, and these kind of uh, changes do affect outcomes. Um, so it's a good point. We will think about how, how maybe that can be incorporated in the, in the framework better. 
And then the, does that answer your question and Esther? We haven't heard from Esther at the moment. Oh yes, she said yes, great. Oh, okay, <laughs> great. And then the question about uh, transformation was Transformation it? in the Ghana case, yeah. Um, uh, can you explain what you mean by the question? Transformation of what? Uh, if the person asking that question wants to jump on, please do. It was me. Uh, Thanks, Leo. Thank you, Nikki. I just wanted to know in one of your slides you said something like the transformative capacity of the program, meaning something like, yeah, that is what I wanted to know. Uh, to me, inclusiveness is just a tool to arrive at transformative uh, procedures while people could, in fact, through the programs, not only improve their livelihoods in a material way, but also their participation in society in the sense of yeah. Uh, yeah, civicness. Yeah, that's a very uh, uh, important uh, aspect of it. And of course, uh, uh, that is what social protection would also aim for. Uh, and therefore, we take uh, this uh, multidimensional approach, indeed, also to look at uh, these kind of uh, more subjective and, and social relational aspects. Um, and in the participatory research that we did within the communities where we did focus groups and interviews uh, over and over again, it was mentioned that uh, when things worked well and people felt the allocation was just, that uh, they felt more seen as citizens and, and also were in a position not to be dependent on others or on handouts, uh, but to be able to uh, uh, offer help to others. And this indeed also changed uh, their participation indeed and uh, their um, um, uh, inclination to uh, undertake new activities, for example. So I agree with you, this is an important aspect to look at. Uh, but we need to look at it more deeply and also over time. Uh, we collected uh, only qualitative data on this, uh, but I think it plays an important role in, uh, in the transformative capacity. Yeah? So not only coping, uh, but also stepping up and uh, improving uh, livelihoods sustainably. But I think Thank maybe you. Alistair has also something to say about it, or not. <laughs> because yeah. I, I think he also looked at this in his research. Alistair, if you want to comment, that would be great. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, it's just, I'm, so my point, my question was about the extreme poor being so detached that actually it's inevitable you know in some ways it's predictable and we've got lots of studies that show that the extremes of inequality um, mean that they're not going to be able to benefit from um, roads as much as those who already have the resources um, equally in terms of social protection it's there's numerous studies that show us that they're not usually able to take productive advantage of this and it kind of takes me back to i mean quite a lot of this and you sort of forgive me all of you saying this this is quite a lot of sort of development talk going on which is we're looking for technocratic solutions to a problem or problems in countries that are essentially political problems so why are these people these groups of people these you know, whether it's uh, female headed households, whether it's particular ethnic groups, whether it's particular religious groups, why are they in the position they're in? It's a bigger question, um, actually, about, uh, you know, if we're serious about development, then how do we ask the honest political questions, both of national leaders, um, local political leaders, but also international partners.
Yes, maybe uh, people uh, uh, in the group also want to react to this uh, challenging question. I think it's a very important one and, and it links back to what uh, Marlene said at the beginning that uh, inequality is uh, ultimately political. Yes, absolutely. Um, if anybody would like to, to join in and, and respond to Alistair's comment, we have people from a number of countries both working in and uh, citizens of countries with different uh, political economies and structures. So if you want to respond to that, please uh, unmute yourself and, and, and do so. In the meantime, I'm looking at the time and we have a number of questions coming through. So I think Nikki and Marlene also said that they will try where possible if we can get answers to you outside of this window, we will. So I know that um, some of you are asking about um, specific demonstrate uh, definitions, examples of uh, transactional costs, etc. So um, some of those straightforward, hopefully more straightforward questions, uh, we will get back to you. Um, you'll also note that there is some discussion and some sharing of links in the chat as well so please make a note of those um, particularly those of you interested in the feeder road project there is a link from Marlene uh, further up the field I, um, I, uh, <laughs> Alistair said he didn't intend to stop the conversation yeah um, no maybe I can respond to it myself uh, yeah if I great may, Rowena, um, <laughs> Because uh, if, if, the, if the framework uh, comes across as, as if it's only looking for technocratic solution, then we need to uh, change the framework. Um, I, I, I think what we try to, uh, we did try to factor in the political and, and, and the social cultural uh, side of things by um, looking at uh, hidden and transaction cost in, in the broader sense. Um, so maybe uh, this is a point to go back to uh, for Marlene and, and me to, to look uh, more critically at the analytical framework to see how we can uh, present it as uh, uh, looking also into uh, uh, voice and empowerment issues and uh, lack of representation at the political level. Um, that is, of course, uh, underlying uh, the exclusionary mechanisms that are going on. Uh, because I do feel that uh, a lot of uh, studies have shown these insights very clearly. Marlene, do you want to yeah. add to that? Yeah, I think that's a very good point, uh, Nikki. Apologies, my, something happened to my camera, so you can only see my picture rather than me live. <laughs> um, no, I think, uh, Alistair, this is a really important point that you're making, and it's, it's obviously the elephant in the room whenever we talk about policies. Mm. Um, I think what we have tried in the current framework if you like is to include that both in the let's say the orange bar that has the political uh, hidden and transaction costs um, and also in the field of strategic collaboration mm. but i yeah i agree nikki that we may have to think about how to bring it out more prominently yeah because quite clearly the fact that there is such a difference between difference between what is there on paper and the actual implementation um, where as Alistair rightly uh, notices you know the extreme poor are not inside uh, is actually an important contribution so it, it's a, that's a very important uh, element that we could um, we should include yeah um, I'm conscious of the time. We have a couple of interesting questions from Jua and Kiza, but I didn't know, Nikki, if you want to make some points in the remaining time you have available or you want to take more questions? Um, well, both. <laughs> um, we, um, 
Yeah, because we uh, we do want to open up the the floor for discussion, eh? and there's time for that. And and at the end, we uh, Marlene and I also have some concluding remarks uh, to be made. So why don't we uh, open up the floor now, okay. and people can uh, choose uh, to yeah, just... uh, to bring uh, their own examples from their own experiences and and viewpoints on this, and especially. I'm interested to hear uh, to what extent there is a political debate on uh, inequality and on certain groups being so detached that they are uh, not even reached by uh, inclusive type of uh, development policies. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really eager to learn more about that, apart well, from the people questions. While people are, are framing their, their thoughts, um, I did, uh, there's a couple of people who've been patiently waiting. So um, Joe Sherman, feel free to, to jump in. But uh, the question there was um, that uh, policies and instruments are, are obviously more inclusive if the process of their design is inclusive as well. So in other words, are the poorest in some way part of these strategic actors that have to make this happen? Uh, is it only about them, the poorest, or is it also with them? And I think we had some interesting discussion on that at the last IADI we webinar with Rachel Sabates Wheeler and those of you interested in social protection. Um, and I know there's a question about sustainability of social protection. Please look up that last um, webinar because there was some interesting uh, case studies there. Uh, Nikki or Marlene, if you wanted to uh, to comment on on Jura's, um statement on inclusivity, yeah, I think the point the point made is is very um, important. Uh, you know, inclusive development is not only about outcomes, but really also about the process. Mm -hmm. So how um, marginalized groups can be included in the process. So that is more the, the advocacy or the co-creation side of it. What was very interesting in, in projects that focused specifically on that, especially in the field of informal sector workers, um, ethnic groups and sex workers, is that there is a language barrier, if you like. So, and, and I'm not talking about a local language versus English language, but even in the local language, there is um, you know, the type of words that are being used in these processes um, make it hard for true exchange and true representation of views being taken up. Uh, for example, the, the project in Kenya on sex workers showed that um, although sex worker organizations were invited to the policy tables, um, their contributions were not taken seriously because uh, they were not framed in the right way. So, you know, having a, a policy conversation also requires that policymakers are able to think differently and think in a different language than they are used to. Any comment on that from you, Joe? I can see you nodding away. Yes, no, I think that Marlene is right with, with, with uh, pointing out uh, some of those uh, obstacles. Uh, I would uh, on, only thank you for the reply anyway, and I would only add maybe you, you made a distinction between outcome and process, uh, which is a valid distinction, but my point is precisely that if the process is also inclusive, then the outcome will also be more inclusive because then some, some possible uh, disadvantages of, of, of a, of a non-participatory design have been avoided. That that would be my point. Mm. That the, the process also, uh, if it is more inclusive, makes for a better outcome. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for that, Kiza. I understand. I can see Kiza is still with us and has a question about. So your uh, analytical framework that you had on earlier, um, Kiza is saying that. Um, I can't imagine that all, not all countries have the necessary means to realize this model. And Kiza, if you wanted to unmute and speak to your question some more, I'm sure that would be very helpful um, for, the, for the speakers to understand it. And uh, sorry, to answer it. And please join in. Uh, well, uh, actually, 
Uh, I was wondering to which extent one could look at this model from a transnational perspective. Uh, as in the case of COVID-19, I, I noticed that some governments, because we are looking basically as, at nation states and their bodies to realize uh, this kind of uh, frameworks, but I, I wonder whether we can look beyond the national state and w which possible ways we have to think beyond the national state to realize this model. Because if countries are weak, um, I can imagine that as a citizen, it, it is very difficult to get the necessary social means and to be included. Mm. Good question. Thank you. Uh, Nikki or Marlene, do you want to take that one? Um, yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot of debate uh, indeed about uh, the whole uh, sustainability uh, question uh, behind uh, social protection, for example, especially with uh, donors uh, ending uh, support, for example, and uh, governments having to be reliant on their own uh, resources, which are often uh, limited. But uh, yeah, these are also political choices, of course, which, uh, what are your budget priorities? And, uh, uh, and it is also linked to uh, a broader discussion on uh, tax, tax in income from taxes. What is your tax base? How is uh, tax uh, being raised in the country? Is it a regressive system? Is it a progressive system? And uh, can, can incomes be generated from, from taxes that can then be redistributed, for example, through uh, social protection or through productive employment programs that um, yeah, have ultimately uh, an, an equalizing uh, effect in, in society. Um, so, yeah, the sustainability uh, question is, of course, uh, part of a hot uh, political debate and uh, it has also obstructed uh, uh, the upscaling of, for example, national uh, health insurance in many uh, African countries. Uh, for that reason, there's a lot of opposition uh, to that too. But I think if we can uh, develop uh, arguments from research that show uh, that ultimately uh, inclusive development uh, also uh, contributes, uh, if, if it can lift up people, uh, more people, um, it can have a, a longer term sustainable impact on uh, the health of the economy and, and, uh, and society then it can also uh, uh, contribute to, uh, to future economic growth. And, and I think we need to get rid of the, the discourse that it is uh, either growth or, uh, or social protection, for example. I think, Nikki and Marlene, it would be great if you could talk us through the other points that you want to make. I know there's, there's questions, but we can gather them up. Um, and so I think if you make your concluding remarks and, and other points, this would be a good time. Okay. Uh, yes, I think uh, some of these points uh, I feel are also coming out of the discussion, but um, I think we can also make some additional points based on the discussion, but, but this is what we prepared in any case. Uh, from the uh, studies that were done under the INCLUDE umbrella, it is clear that it takes extra efforts and resources to include the extreme poor in social uh, uh, protection policies and programs, but also in other uh, uh, social economic policies. Um, in order to effectively reach uh, the extreme poor, uh, we need to reduce hidden cost and transaction costs, which can be social, economic and political in nature. Um, we need to uh, try and identify possible negative externalities and uh, plan to address these, in the, because these can also emerge in the process. 
And maybe Marlene, you want to uh, conclude on the other points? Yeah, very well. Um, uh, I think both the, the social protection study and the, the infrastructure study also show that these the, the potential benefits do not come automatically. So it's important to invest in con confounding factors. For example, have sufficient health infrastructure, have sufficient transportation facilities, the quality of schooling, etc. Um, and then, and I think this relates to the discussion we were just having, is that it's important to have inclusive perspectives along the full policy, policy design and implementation. And so what can be inclusive on paper may not be inclusive when implemented. And the example of the private contractors for road construction that were not willing to employ women or, or paid women lower wages is, an, is a, an example of that. But there are many, many other examples. So inclusive perspectives along the full uh, chain between policy design and implementation. So from national level governments to local level implementers is important too. Okay, that uh, concludes uh, at least our part of the presentation. We have listed some suggested uh, readings for you and uh, a link also to the INCLUDE platform where there are uh, reports and policy briefs and other outputs uh, of the uh, 17 uh, studies that uh, Marleen uh, mentioned at the beginning. And uh, of course, we are also available uh, if you want uh, any specific material uh, on, uh, on the topics that were discussed. Great, thank you very much, uh, Nikki and Marlene. It was wonderful and I think it's very clear that uh, everyone could talk to you for uh, a lot longer than the time we have allowed for. So hopefully people will be in touch with uh, with interesting discussions. Um, just to let everybody know that um, there will be a recording, it will be on YouTube, so you can watch again at your leisure. Um, and the best way to know when that's available, if you uh, subscribe to the EADI newsletter or follow them on social media. Um, there are also a number of links in the chat and discussion in the chat. So while I will stop the video, um, I will leave the, the group chat open so that everybody can uh, take any details from there. And we will also take the questions and, and look at how we can follow those up as well. And I would like to thank you all for coming because of Nikki and Marlene can talk all day, but it's great to have somebody to listen to. And so we're very grateful that you have, you have joined us and thank you so much for to our wonderful professors for their time today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Rowena, for facilitating. Bye, Bye everybody. Safe, everybody. Thank you.